Well, good morning. Sorry for that little bit of a delay. Good morning. This is Pastor Nelson, Associate Pastor at Tower View Baptist Church. And this is your morning Sunday school lesson. Um, you can find out more about our church at Tower View Baptist Tower View Baptist Church. Yes, that's our web. That's our Facebook page. Our uh, website is towerviewkc.com. That you can find out more information. This morning, uh, later this morning, we will have um, drive-in church at ten thirty, and for up to fifty people, if you bring your chair or if you want to sit on the grass, you can come out, get out of your car, and sit on the grass to the area to the right of the uh, pickup truck where Pastor Darren preaches from in the um, next next to the sanctuary building. We'll have some speakers set up out there so you can hear everything. Um, it looks like the weather is going to cooperate with us today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, let's see. I'm just checking some things. Um, okay. All right. It looks like we're on. All right. I'm just checking some settings here. Thank you. And like I said, this morning's lesson is we're continuing through the book of Romans. And we're getting close to the end. We're going to be in Romans chapter 14 this morning. And before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, I just thank you and praise you for all the blessings that you provide. You are a mighty God. Give us wisdom. Give us insight, Lord, as we look at your word this morning. We thank you for all that you provide, Lord. We just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. All right. We're in Romans 14, but remember, as we've been going through the book of Romans, after chapter 12, things change. So I'm going to remind us what changed in chapter 12. In chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And so this whole section, in chapters 12 through 15, is about discerning what is good and what is pleasing and what is the perfect will of God. It is about transforming our minds from this world which is about individualism, is about my rights, it's about me, but transforming it and say, no, I am a living sacrifice. I am going to live differently this morning. I'm going to live differently today. And so, and, and then down in verse 9, in chapter 12, verse 9, it says, let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good, Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack zeal. Do not lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayers. Share with the saints their needs. Pursue hospitality. And so, as Christians, we are minds are to be transformed, not to be thinking like the world. We are to be thinking about how can I live as a sacrifice to God, a living sacrifice that's pleasing to God. And then here he spells it out some in chapter 12. Live without hypocrisy, det hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good, love one another deeply, outdo one another in showing honor. Okay, be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in the hope. Be patient in your infliction. Be persistent with your prayers. Share with the saints. And so that is what all chapters 12 through 15 are talking about. And this morning we're going to look at chapter 14. And chapter 14 has been a chapter that has been used and abused by Christians for centuries. Uh, it's kind of like... Uh, Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 7, 1. Do not judge lest you be judged. That's another verse that has been used and abused. Um, so in chapter 14, that's where we're at this morning. In chapter 14, starting in verse 1, it says, 
Accept anyone who is weak in the faith, don't, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on the one who does not eat, and anyone who does not eat must not judge the one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another household servant? Before his own Lord he stands or falls, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. And so Paul is now going into a section, how do we deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ over disputed matters? Things that are not specifically spelled out in Scripture. And the first subject he talks about is eating food. And he talks about people who don't eat meat versus people who um, eat meat. And there's a couple different reasons why in, in the first century church in Paul's day that they would not eat meat. One of them was the Jewish Christians. The Jewish Christians could only eat meat if it was killed in a kosher, what we now call kosher. In, 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 if it was killed according to Jewish regulations. And so God had a specific way you were supposed to, to um, kill an animal. And if you didn't do it that way, you weren't supposed to eat it. And so it, in today's vernacular, we, we call it kosher. And that also it, it pertained to the type of meat you could eat. What, what Was the animal clean or unclean? But also in Paul's day, and Paul spells this out in, first, in his letter in 1 Corinthians, should you eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols? In Paul's day, there were many temples around, and there were many people sacrificing in those temples. Not just in Jerusalem. There were temples to all the different Roman, to many of the different Roman gods and Greek gods, and they would offer sacrifices to those gods. And then later, that meat that was sacrificed was sold at the city market. So you could go down to the grocery store, down to the meat market, and you could buy some steak. And that steak may or may not came from an animal that was sacrificed at, the, at a pagan temple, at a temple to Zeus or Apollo or whomever was they, they sacrificed it to. I never remember Zeus and Apollo, who's Greek and who's Roman, so I just say both. Um, and so that who, you know, that's what, you know, in Paul's day, that's what people were thinking about. So somebody that came out of a Gentile that came out of that pagan culture that used to participate in Roman um, religion, they might say, I have to get away from that religion, so I am not going to eat that meat that's been sacrificed at the temple, at the pagan temple. So Paul saying, and so it could be a, a Jewish Christian that's saying, no, I'm not going to eat this meat because it's not killed, slaughtered the proper way. Or it could be a Gentile Christian that's saying, no, I am not going to eat meat that's been sacrificed at a pagan temple because I came out of that and I'm not going to keep doing that. And Paul calls the person who doesn't eat meat weak. Now, as I read through this, I'm wondering if he's putting weak, if we, if we did it today, put weak in quotation marks. Yeah, they're weak because they don't eat meat. And I, I don't know if that's true. And, and if, if they are weak, it's they're weak in their understanding of God's word, not weak in that their faith is weak. And so I think we need to make that distinction. If anything, they're only weak in understanding because Paul understood, and he explains this in 1 Corinthians. So if you'll read through 1 Corinthians, um, you, you, you'll see more of this in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, if it's offered at a temple, so what? It's just a piece of metal. It's just a piece of stone. It's just a statue. It doesn't mean anything. There's no real God there. So what does it matter if it's offered on that, on that altar? Big deal. But some people, out of their own conscience, and because they came out of that, they said, no, I can't eat that. There's no way I can eat that. And Paul said, fine. That's fine. If you don't want to eat it, fine. Don't eat it. And here, so we have two sets of Christians. Some that choose to eat meat and say, okay, it doesn't matter, and I'll eat it no matter what. And others are saying, no, I can't eat that because, and then they list the reason. And Paul doesn't list the reasons why people don't eat meat. And I think he does that because, one, like I said, there's multiple reasons people don't eat meat. There are Christians today who don't eat meat. 
they follow what's called the uh, Daniel diet because they go back and they look at read chapters one and two of Daniel and they see that Daniel ate a certain type of food and they go, well, I must. Daniel was a spiritual person. I have to eat that kind of food too. And in Daniel, that's descriptive. It's not proscriptive. It's just describing what Daniel did in his time, but it's not saying that oh, you must do it this way. But some Christians do that, and that's fine. There's nothing that said. There's nothing in the Scripture that says you must eat meat. If you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. But Paul's saying if you do eat meat or if you don't eat meat, that's not the issue. The issue is how you're treating one another. Because both of them, whether you eat meat or not, you must do it for the right reasons. You must be doing it because you were serving God. Not because you want to look good to somebody else. Not because you saw some documentary on Netflix. No, you must be doing this for God. And you must not, and if somebody chooses to do that, you must not be critical of them. That's like, you, you know, many of us work, or hopefully still working. Do you work walk into somebody else's place of employment and tell the employees how to do their job? Do you go in there and start writing them up because they failed to do their job correctly? That's not your role. And that's what Paul's saying in verse 4. Who are you to judge another man's servant? And so that person is not your servant that's not eating meat. He's God's servant. And so he must answer to God. That's what it says in verse 4. He, w- he will stand before the Lord. So we will stand before the Lord on the decisions that we make. What do we you know, do? We eat meat or not eat meat? Or are we picky about which meat we eat? Um, as an army chaplain, um, when we go do an exercise out in the field, I have to make sure, um, I have to check my soldiers and see if there are any Jewish soldiers that... Um, that are practicing Jewish soldiers that want to eat only kosher food. In the same way, I have to find to see if there are any Islamic soldiers that only want to eat halal food. And if there is, I need to go talk to the supply sergeant and tell the supply sergeant, hey, you need to make sure you have so many kosher meals. You need to make sure you have so many halal meals. And that is one of my roles as an army chaplain, is to make sure that I'm taking care of all the soldiers, no matter what their religion and no matter what their dietary needs. Now, if I just got a soldier that says, comes up and says, hey, I don't want to eat meat. Okay, why? Because I don't want to eat meat. I'm just, a, I'm just a vegetarian. Okay, fine. Go tell the supply sergeant. That's your issue. Um, that's not me. There are vegan, MR, a vegan uh, veg- or a vegetarian anyways, MREs. So they can go find those. Or they just don't eat the meat uh, pieces out of their MRE. But that's not a religious matter. But here, this is people who are doing things for a religious reason. I am serving God by not eating meat. I am serving God by eating this meat. Whatever you're doing, do it because you're serving God. And if another person chooses a different line, that's on them. That's not on you. This is a disputed matter. Continuing on in verse 5. Um... One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day, observe it to the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to the Lord. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. So in verses 5 and 6, now he talks about days. Or is every day the same, or are there specific days that are better than others? This is the thing that Christians today argue about. I'm on some Facebook page groups, and there are people who say, you know, Sunday is a holy day. We should keep the Sabbath, as they did in the Old Testament. Absolutely. Others um, are saying, you know, well, yeah, we need to worship God on Sunday if we can, but if not, you know, you can go to Saturday night church. It, you know, it doesn't matter. There are places in this world you can't worship on Sunday because Sunday is a work day. It's a school day. Um, and so they, they worship on maybe on a Friday because it's an Islamic country. And that's when they get the Islamic countries. Friday is a time off so they can go to the mosque, but it's also a time off so the Christians can go to church. So it's not illegal to serve to go to church in all Muslim countries. It depends on the country. Um, so there are churches in some Muslim countries. In Kuwait, in Qatar, there are Christian churches there, and they're perfectly legal to go worship at them. 
And so it depends where you're at. You may be, you know, if you work in a hospital, you're a fireman or a policeman, you, you may have to work on some Sundays. And so you can't go to church every Sunday, but maybe you, you can do other things. You watch, the, watch online on other times of the week. Right now, during this whole COVID thing, it makes it really hard to seem like we're worshiping on Sunday when we can't, you know, you don't feel like you can get together. And for a while, we could not get together. Now we're sort of getting together in, in a social distancing sort of way. And so, and, and in, you know, holy days, you know, if there was a Jewish Christian, they might want to keep all the Jewish holy days. And the pagan Christians are like, those don't mean anything to me. Even in today's world, there are Christians who say, no, I won't, I don't celebrate Christmas because that's, that's not in the Bible. And so that's, that's not a prescribed holy day, so I'm not going to worship on that day. That's not a special day to me. So there are different things like that that we, we may argue about. Should we go to church and have a worship service on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day? Some Christians say, yeah, sure. And others say, no. Um, should we do a Good Friday service? Some say, most, you know, many Christians say yes, but not all Christians say yes. And, and what day is Easter? The Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Eastern Church, has a different day for Easter than they do than uh, the Western Church that we, we celebrate. So who's right? And it's Paul saying, it doesn't matter. If you're going to worship God on a specific day, then worship him. And if somebody else says, no, I'm not going to worship God that day because, and they give a, a, some sort of reason, then they need to not worship God for, and, and on that day for their reason. And we shouldn't look down on them for worshiping, and they shouldn't look down on us for worshiping, or vice versa. We shouldn't look down at the Orthodox Church because their Easter is on a different day. And their Christmas is on a different day. So what? As long as they worship God and they serve. And so that's what Paul said. It's not what these are disputed matters. Now, not every matter in, in Scripture is a disputed. I get that. But sometimes there are. What do we do? In verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 7. For none of us lives for himself, no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, we, whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. And now Paul's getting to that. This is why it matters. We are, whatever we do, we are doing it for the Lord. This is almost sound like this is like relativistic Christianity. Well, this come in, if it's right for you, it's right. If it's wrong for you, it's wrong. And in certain areas, that is a true statement. Certain areas, not in every area. Adultery is adultery. All right, murder is murder. Coveting is coveting. There, there, there is no disclaimer there. There is only one way to salvation. There is no disclaimer there. There is no room, wiggle room. There is only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. There is no relativity there. This is only in the area of disputed matters, in areas where it's not spelled out in Scripture, especially in the New Testament. The world changed in the New Testament. And so things are not spelled out the same. Should we baptize infants or not? That's a disputed matter. Some Christians are fully convinced the Scripture teaches us to baptize infants. And others, like me, are fully convinced the Scripture does not teach that. Okay, But that doesn't mean that the people who baptize infants are, are, are false Christians. Okay, They are doing it to serve the Lord. I don't baptize my infants to serve the Lord. That's a disputed matter. But what's not disputed is Christians should be baptized. No qualms there. As a Christian, out of obedience, you should be baptized. That is not a disputed matter. And so Paul is saying that what do you do? You do for the Lord. Whether we live or whether we die, we do it for God. That goes back to Romans 12, 9 and 10. 
It says, let your love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's what it's all about. We are to serve God all the time, every day, no matter the circumstances, and give grace to our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't view things exactly the way we do. And if you don't have a strong view, you need to read more scripture and get a view. But that's one of the troubles with those of us Christians who read the scripture and say, hey, I, I got it. This is how to live life. And we get exactly right. And we think everybody needs to be exactly like us. Like the military, a uniform. What's it? Uniform. Everybody wears the exact same thing. You were told what kind of boots to wear. You were told what kind of socks to wear. You were told what kind of t-shirt to wear. You were told what kind of pants to wear, what kind of belt, what kind of shirt, where to put your name tag, where to put the U.S. Army thing, where to put your rank. All that is prescribed. And it said you must do it all. You must all be identical. If anybody is out of uniform, they're wrong. If you change up your uniform, you're wrong. And those of us in conservative Christianity, we tend to be that way. Everybody must be exactly like us. And if you're off by a little bit, you're wrong and you're not following God. Liberal Christianity is kind of the other way around. It really doesn't matter what you wear. You can wear a military uniform. You can wear a ball gown and a tuxedo. Or you can wear flip-flops and baggy shorts. Or you can wear a bikini. It doesn't matter. And that's wrong too. That's going off the deep end on the other end. Because they say it doesn't matter what you believe. That, that's the Unitarian Church. It doesn't matter what you believe. You believe Jesus, great. If you believe you know, that these puppets over here over my shoulder are, 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 are your God, great. You can believe that. It doesn't matter what you believe. And that's wrong too. But those of us conservative, we tend to get very narrow-minded and everybody has to be exactly like us. And if they're not, they're wrong. And they're not following God. And Paul's saying, no, that's a wrong attitude to have. They need, if they're doing it to serve God with all their heart and with all their soul, they're doing it the right reason. Should we be loud and excited in church, or should we all sit still and sit, sit quietly? I've been to both churches. They both have their place, and people do it because they're serving God. People who sit quietly says, well, I'm sitting out of reverence to God. I'm sitting here quietly. I'm going to listen to the pastor. And the people who get loud and excited says, how can you contain it? This is exciting. I can't keep it in. i got to celebrate. Neither both are people serving God out of their own heart. Verse 9 Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. Verse 10 But you, but you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And that's the point. We each will give an account to God. And over these disputed matters, God will be the judge. He doesn't give us every detail. That's why there are so many different kinds of church churches out there. Because the scripture doesn't specifically say this is how to run the church here's an example of your church constitution here's a worship order for your church that's not in the scripture we don't get any pictures of what they did during the service where do you put the lord's supper in the service do you put it at the beginning or at the end or in the middle we don't get that in in, in scripture should the pastor be the dictator and decide everything, or should it be a congre congregational run? Or do you just have a, a small group of elders that get together? The scripture shows examples of all those. And you can look down through history and you can see examples of all those doing well if you have godly leadership. When you don't have godly leadership, those all fail. So to me, the biggest deal is, is it godly? Are you following God with all your heart and 
with all your mind and with all your soul and all your strength. It'll work. And so each of us. And so the elephant in the room, what do we do with COVID? How do we get back together? What should we do? One, we got to remember Jesus Christ, number one. He is the way to salvation. In this church, we have preached, and rightly so, I think, that we should not forsake the gathering ourselves together. That is scripture. We should as much as possible get together. But these are not normal times. When things are normal, these are not normal times. There is a physical danger for getting together right now. And we see that in the news. Why did this COVID hit New York City so much worse than some other places? Because they are so close together. They have so much mass transit between buses and subways and taxi cabs they, they, and, and crowded streets that they're very close together. And so COVID can pass easily in those confined spaces from one person to another. And so what do we do? You know, we've been told, you know, social distancing. What do we do? Well, initially we were said, don't meet. And we followed, and the example of Romans 13 says, follow the rules of, of, of your, the land. Follow your rulers. And we, and, but part of that is following their laws, but also it's just, calm, you know, your godly wisdom that he has given us. Let's not put our brothers and sisters in Christ in physical danger. When it's not persecution. This is not the Chinese church where you're worried about being persecuted. This is not about persecution not at the moment. This is about health and safety. You know, if, you know, what do we, you know, would we have church, you know, if, if you're on the coast, if you're down on, you know, on the Gulf of Mexico and there's a hurricane coming and it's going to hit landfall on Sunday morning, are you going to have church? No. Do we cancel church when there's a blizzard in Kansas City? Yes, we cancel church when there's a blizzard or an ice storm because it's physically dangerous for people to get out. There's no difference here with COVID. It's physically dangerous. Now, now the disputed part. Is it still physically dangerous? How physically dangerous? What rules can we go? Some are still quarantining themselves in their house. Others are going out and about. Who's right? Who's wrong? Which news channel are you listening to? Are you listening to any news channels? So that's a disputed matter. So we need to give grace. And so while scripture says, you know, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Right now we're doing weird things like I'm doing Facebook Live right now for Sunday school lesson. And I'm sitting in this Sunday school room which is um, Pastor Craig's Sunday School Room, but also on Wednesday nights, when we have Wednesday nights, it's Club 316 Storybook Room. It's the story room where Miss Patricia gives the the, the story lesson to the kids, which is why there's things on the wall and puppets in here. And so, you know, that's a disputing matter, but we're not meeting together right now. But some want to meet. Let's go inside the church and just do things as normal. Others say, no, let's stay away from each other. And so we're kind of going, we're kind of giving you a a flavor. So we're doing, everything is still online. So I am online for Sunday school. Pastor Darren still records his sermon and it's posted online. And the music is still online. So if you don't feel safe getting out, even to go to um, drive-in church, you can. You can stay home. And worship to the best of your ability there. But worship. On Easter Sunday, we started drive-in church at Tower View. And you can come and sit in your car and turn your radio to 91.9 and you can listen to the worship service on your radio sitting in your car and you can at least see other members of the church in the parking lot in their cars. Starting this morning, um, the city of Kansas City has said, okay, you can meet up to 50 people outside. So if you bring a lawn chair, you can sit outside. We're going to have speakers outside. And you can sit outside as long as you still stay six feet apart, which is about the wingspan of me. So if you can stand and not not touch anybody on either side, then you're six feet apart. Um, And so, um, you know, you, you can do that if you desire, if you feel safe. Okay, but some not everybody will feel safe. So let's not look down on those who stay in their car. 
Let's not look down on those who stay home. And those of you who stay home, let's not look down on those who, who come here and want to sit outside. That's what Paul is saying. We are all trying to serve God to the best of our ability. And we each must answer to God for our own actions. But that also means if you reach out your hand to shake your hand and they pull their hand back, we must not, one, not be mad at each other. You must not be mad at the one who's wanting to shake your hand. And you, when they pull their hand back, you must not be mad at them for not wanting to shake your hand. Be gracious to one another. God has been gracious to you over and over and over again. How patient has God been with you? How much grace has he given you over your repetitive sins that you have? We must give that same grace to one another. That's what Paul's talking about. And it causes Paul to worship. In verse 11, he, he reminds us of the Old Testament. It says, and live, it remembers that every knee will bow. We will all bow before God, every Christian. And that's what we are doing. In verse, the lesson plan stops at verse 12. But remember, this eternity is what matters. Verse 13, it says, Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in the way of your brother and sister. And so at this time, you know, we as church leaders, we're going to have to be gracious to people who aren't coming to church. How do we take attendance? Oh, my light, my light just went out. Um, you know, how do you take attendance to online church? How do we take Sunday school attendance for watching this? There are some people online, and I can see Judy and Shirley and Darren have, have made comments online, that so I know they're watching. But how many others are watching that didn't make a comment? Do they not count? Um, you know, how many are going to watch this later? And so we won't see them. Facebook doesn't give us a by name list of who watched your video and how long they watched. If you go down here and watch for one minute, it, Facebook counts that as a view. It, it counts as a view if it's only for a few seconds. Um, how do we take attendance for that? How do we take attendance for church? We could take attendance out there. The way we've been taking attendance since we've been driving church is just count number of cars instead of trying to count how many people are inside of each car. You know, how do we do that? It, it's hard. We, we have to give grace. But because of God's grace, because God loves us, even when we, in these disputed matters, we can rejoice. And Paul says that in chapter 5, um, going down to verse 9. Chapter 5, 9. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to start in verse 7. Chap Did I say chapter 5? Chapter 15. Sorry. Chapter 15 and verse 7, it says this. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ Jesus also accepted you, to the glory of God. So to accept one another, whether you stay at home, whether you stay in the car, or whether you get out of the car and sit in the, in the grass at our, at our church, or however you're doing it at your church, accept one another. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the fathers and so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written. And now here Paul is celebrating and he's celebrating with Old Testament scriptures, which were the scriptures to him. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will appear. The one who, will, who rises to rule the Gentiles. The Gentiles will hope in him. And we are the Gentiles. Most of us are. Verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is our goal, is to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, to have our minds and our bodies transformed by God because that is the will of God and not to conform to the practices of the world. Shaking hands or not shaking hands, social distances, that is a that is a practical thing. It's like wearing your seatbelt in your car. 
Okay, it's a wise thing to keep from spreading a disease that we, the the, the, the insidious of this disease that some people have it and they don't know they have it, and they can pass it on to others. There's so much about this virus that we don't know about, which makes it makes us feel helpless. We may be helpless about knowing how this virus spreads sometimes, but we are not hopeless in our life. Christ gives us life, and that's the important thing. That's our eternity. COVID will go away someday. It either go away because we develop a vaccine and we get rid of it like we did smallpox, or we will get it and we will die, and then COVID will be gone, and we'll be in heaven with Jesus. Is that a bad thing? We don't know what this world happens. We wear a seatbelt because it makes us safer. But it still does not guarantee that you will not die in a car crash. We go to the basement when a tornado comes because that's the safest place. But it's still no guarantee that you will not die if a tornado hits your house. This life... You know, we try to eat healthy so we don't get, you know, you know, and we don't eat too much fat and, and cholesterol so we keep our cholesterol down so we don't have a heart attack. But yet someday we will get old and pass away. And so while we try to live to the best of our wisdom and as healthily as we can, we don't know what the future holds. We drive as safely as possible, but that doesn't mean somebody else is not going to run a stoplight and, and T-bone you at the intersection. We live as safely as possible, but that doesn't but that doesn't guarantee us anything. If God says your time is to die, you can do every precaution in the world against COVID. That doesn't mean you may still get COVID and die because God said it's your time. And if God says, I have a plan for you in the future, then you're, today is not your day. When I was deployed, I, I went with units. I weren't, wasn't in direct combat units. But I knew I was in places where you know something might happen. But I realized that no matter what, if, if, it, if God says your time on this earth is done, my body armor, all the soldiers around me that had all the weapons in the world would not stop me from dying. And in the same way, no matter what the dire circumstances was in that I was in, if God wanted me to live, the enemy could not kill me. But I don't know what God has in store for me. I don't know what God has in store for you, and neither do you. So let us rejoice in God over disputed matters and give grace to one another the same way that God has given grace to you. He has given you grace and grace and grace. It is our job to give grace to others and to honor them and to serve them and not to be hypocritical and detest evil and cling to what is good and give grace for others who don't follow the same procedures that we do. Doesn't mean we don't correct somebody you know, it doesn't mean that we can't talk about our opinions, but do it with grace and mercy. The same grace that God has given you, you must pass on to others. That is your living sacrifice. Giving up the right to be right all the time. So I thank you for watching. I thank you for listening today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord God, I just thank you and praise you as we continue with this Sunday School Lessons, Lord, as we go through, finish up with the Book of Romans. Almost. We've got one more week in the Book of Romans. Thank you for the grace and mercy that you gave us. Help us to show that grace and mercy to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to worship you wherever we are this morning. Whether we are at home, whether we are in our cars, in the parking lot, whether we are sitting in the grass in a lawn chair. Wherever that may be, help us to worship you today. Help us to worship you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength. Because you are the mighty God. And we just pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Once again, I'm Pastor Nelson. And I got dark here at the end. My, uh, I got a new light and it's battery operated and I didn't read.
charge it this week, and it died. So the ending was, wasn't was quite as bright as the beginning. Um, we're at Tower View Baptist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. You can find out more about us on our website at towerviewkc.com. You can find the pastor's sermon will be posted there later this morning. Pastor Craig's uh, songs will be posted there later this morning. If you're in the area, you can come to our church. We're at the corner of Northeast 50th Street and Randolph Road by Worlds of Fun, by the Worlds of Fun Water Tower. And you can come and sit in the parking lot and, and uh, listen to the service. Um, up to 50 people can sit outside, appropriately spaced. We need to be spaced apart. Fam families can sit together, but we need to be sitting apart from one another. And we'll have speakers outside if you want to sit out in the grass. Looks like the rain is going to hold off this morning. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And uh, I pray that God's blessings will, will be upon you. And continue worshiping God in all that you do every day, at work, at home, at play. Praise God and God bless.